Hi, everybody. Welcome to Talking True, where I have the great good fortune of interviewing mystics, near-death experiencers, non-dual teachers, and people who are waking up to the truth of who they are. So today I have a special guest. His name is Sunya. He's a non-dual teacher and he has his own channel here on YouTube. And we're just going to dive in to the theme, discover what is already here. So Sonia, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's great to have you with me today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. So do you want to just cut, you know, everybody loves a good story, right? Do you want to, um, while we realize, <laughs> you know, none of us have the story, um, do you want to just briefly maybe define or describe what happened in terms of your own self-recognition? You know, what did that look like? This is probably the, the hardest thing to do <laughs> because as you, you may recognize yourself, it is simultaneously the, the journey that is a step to nowhere is kind of the destruction of the story itself. So to kind of recount that, as you say, it does come with a Himalayan sized asterisk um that really what occurred didn't cause the dissolution of the self and i think the the risk that i've seen my myself personally going back in in so called time is that the stories you know mind loves stories right so mind loves to sort of compare and say oh that's interesting did i have that or if i didn't have that the mind will say oh I've not realized quite as much as this person because they've experienced something I haven't. Mm -hmm. So it can lead to all these comparisons of, you know, why it occurred or did this cause this and that. So with all that said, I don't think any of this particularly, it has interest obviously to the mind and the so-called separate selves will, will find interest in it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think there's any deeper meaning in it so much. It's kind of, because the character that went through this doesn't exist. Right. So with that said, um, the, I mean, essentially it's kind of a clash of two paths. So I was on the sort of materialistic path as many people in the Western world were on. Um, and I was trying everything that I could to be happy. Like most people are right. Um, and I tried many different things over the course of time, experiences, relationships, substances. I, I made millions of pounds or dollars in my business. I became so-called successful at sport. And I did all of these things. But whenever I got to the top of the so-called mountain, there was actually nothing there. There was a deep sense of, well, that's weird. Mm -hmm. Um. And at the same time that this was going on, it wasn't like it was a a sudden realization. At the same time, there was this twin path going on of sort of the spirituality side, even though I didn't initially even recognize it as such. Um, I was, you know, the character, so to speak, was taught, you know, to meditate um, at school from an early age. Uh, so that'd be like four decades ago. Um then there were things like, you know, an out of body experience um, when I was very sick in bed and I was walking around my room and I was doing very ordinary things in the room. So I was studying the posters on the wall. I went up to the keys in the door of the room and jangled the keys just to say, oh, this, yeah, because you don't do that in a dream. Like, that's a very normal thing. And then I thought, oh, I'll look and see what time it is. So I had a digital watch at the time. I looked at my watch and it just said zero, 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 zero. And it wasn't moving. I thought, this is super weird. So then I turned around to the bed and I was on the bed. And then when I pushed myself on the bed, I kind of woke up. So there were, there were things like this that were going on in, in tandem. I then, in one when there was this big sort of pivotal moment in business where everything kind of came tumbling down, um, I 
went down this sort of Buddhist path and this whole, you know, the power of now and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And I actually studied very closely with a, a Buddhist monk up here in Scotland. And we became very good friends. So it was kind of interesting. I was teaching him business and he was teaching me meditation and, and Buddhism. We would go out for meals and, you know, come around to my house and things like that. And then during that stage, there was... Um, something that happened during meditation that I only recognized a few years later as exactly what it was. But it was this sense that, um, and bearing in mind at this point, I think I'd read one spirituality book, which is The Power of Now um, by Eckhart Tolle. I wasn't watching YouTube video. I wasn't pursuing anything. It was more just, I'm just meditating. It's, I guess, a seeking of truth in some sense. But I didn't know. I didn't know any of the lingo or any of the, There was no expectation, you know. But during one of these meditations, there was literally nothing happening. So there were, it was a no thought, no experience. It's difficult to describe, but it, it felt like death and it was okay. Now, at that moment, there was this huge sort of, inrush and simultaneously outrush from the from the top of my head and the only way i can describe it is it just felt like the universe was pouring into my brain i mean i was like shaking and it was exhilarating but it was also like what the heck is going on um and i mentioned it in my meditation group the, the next week and you know few people looked at me a bit weird but no, nobody really you know I was, I was looking for like what's going on here what is this anyway a few years went by and so i was you know look learning more and then people said oh that's probably a, a crown chakra thing it's this energy thing and then i studied uh on the or well, read a lot and consumed almost everything by Adya Shanti, who's a american former zen uh monk and he described exactly the same experience that he had, which was the beginning of his awakening where he, he was a re religious uh, meditator every day, hours every day in the Zen tradition, you know, been hit on the back with a stick. Yes. And one day he just, he just thought, I can't do this. I, I cannot do this. And he, and he gave up. And at that point he experienced the same um, thing that I did. And for a time, there was a um, a longing for repeating experience. You, you, I kind of got stuck in trying to go back to something, recreate something, and what I call this whole flip flopping in spirituality. Like, oh, I had it, I've lost it. Like, yes. you know, what's the right thing to? feel now should i be thinking that, oh i've dropped out of it again now am yes. i you know am i <laughs> pretending i feel like maybe i was pretending before because i don't feel like that now um and yeah fast forward a, a few years i guess to, to towards the the end or never the end but the, the sort of latest chapters of this uh, story of, of this non-existent character um I was at a swimming pool watching my daughter swim at a swimming class. And suddenly it just became obvious that everything was the same. So the substance that made the water, the substance that was my daughter and the substance that was the tiles next to the pool, everything was the same. Now it wasn't an intellectual thing. It was a very visceral thing everything and this obviously this is a common theme but all of this is beyond mind like the you know it's beyond mind and it's beyond description and it's beyond words but we still try yes. um you know and, and for anybody that's experienced any of these things you, you you'll know that you just it, it's just a knowing of it but the best way that i can describe it is that Prior to this, every object would have either a coldness about it or a potential threat 
but not threat, but a low level disinterest to me mm -hmm. or, or from me. Like, oh, that's just a fence. Like, that's got nothing to do with me. Or that's a pencil, or whatever. But after this, everything had a luminosity about it. It had a a benevolent ambivalence. So what I mean by that is it not ambivalent like oh, I could care less, but everything is benevolent to you regardless of what it is or who you are or what you do. Um, and I, I sought to sort of verify that on the drive home. So I was looking at houses and houses had it, cars had it, the steering wheel had it. And I even went outside when I got home and there was bird poop on the back step. And I was looking at that. I was like, this is so weird. Like everything now has that. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, after, after that, there was this sense of, I don't know, not a car. It's hard to put it into time, but um, this this understanding that I, I was everything, um, which people sometimes get confused by and they think, oh, that's such an ego thing, like you're just saying you're everything, but it's more that everything is I rather than I, the person, I am all this. So that was a a weird thing. So even on things like dog walks, I would feel, as the grass, I would feel steps walking on me as I was walking the dog. It, it's, uh, it's hard to describe. Um, yes. And as a result of that, the it was pretty obvious that there was no body or no person here. So it's kind of this simultaneous um, being everything, but also being nothing. So you're, you're nothing in sense of you know in sense of the person. So that's the kind of shortened version. I mean, obviously within that, there's you know long bouts of you know self-inquiry and meditation and on other things and unfoldings of course it never it never ends the the metaphor that i like to use is you know when the universe was one star old you know it was perfect but it and whole but it was still becoming perfect you know when it was a thousand star it's the same you know so they always these little things always feel final, but it's just, it's the never ending mystery. Um, so yeah, ultimately, as I said at the beginning of this story, it's it really just on becoming what I never was and seeing what I have always been, um, which is like the hugest cosmic joke that there is right i mean yes. you know you you set off on this journey with like you know a compass to, to decide which way you're going to go with a name uh with signposts because you think you you know you want to say am i at this stage is this right am i off track and you end up back where you started but there's no person there's no signposts and there's no compass and so at the deepest level, nothing has changed, but uh, to to another level that like everything's changed. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I I always um, think about what Bhagavan Nityananda of Ganeshpur used to say. He called it the path of return because we we're driven. You know, if you have some kind of glimpse of the self or whatever you want to describe that, right? that fires you up to go on this journey. And you, like you said, you, you know, you're looking for signposts and you're looking for levels and you, you think you're getting there, wherever there is. <laughs> it's just, uh, it's just this huge cosmic joke because at a certain point, um, seeking almost becomes distasteful, which is certainly what happened in my story. 
I just got so fed up with the whole seeking game. And then I recognized that seeking itself was the obstacle. And with that recognition, everything just collapsed. The whole seeking, everything just collapsed. And then, you know, you get to see what the weight of that looks like and feels like. I mean, there's a huge weight to that, right? This kind of accumulating these ideas and concepts and beliefs about who you think you are and, you know, where you're getting to and all of that. And um, it's a real, it's a relief when that, when that falls away. And I, I, I love what you shared about seeing, seeing yourself, you know, everything at the swimming pool, because I, I had a similar experience. I was just sitting at home. I just made coffee and I put some creamer into my coffee and then I put the you know the creamer back on the opposite counter and I just sat there and all of a sudden it was like I had this amazing love for this creamer and then that I recognized that every single thing that I was looking at was the same mm -hmm. and I was included within that and um I couldn't I got it was like I couldn't identify the separation anymore is, you know, it's re really hard, as you said, to put this into words. Um, but that, and then that would show itself in dreams. I'd have lucid dreams where I was the same energy as all the forms within the dreams. And, and that then continued in the waking state. So I, I always find it fascinating the way the self, I like to say the self wakes up to itself. But even then, you know, with these words, it's really, <laughs> um, but it, it's just fascinating the way it reveals itself or the mystery reveals itself, however you want to put it. Um, and it's so unique for each, each and every one of us. And, you know, we get to that point where we realize, <laughs> actually, I don't exist. I never existed. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, that's when I think that, you know, that really what happens is that's when you really begin to live your life mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, fully rather than, being invested in seeking, 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 seeking. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about what's happening today and where you're at today? Well, today it's, I mean, let's talk about the weight. There's just something I wanted to say there about the weight of okay. seeking. and um, Because one of the things that, that I've seen people get hung up on and it tripped me up was this whole let go, right? It's that, a lot of spiritual teachers will say, oh, you just need to let go. You just need to stop seeking. And you you are, you are already this. And there's a, there's a time when that is like infuriating to hear. Yes. Like it, yes. It, you know, the mind is, I always call it, the mind is, is a separation machine. You know, it, it dislikes reality. It wants more. It wants better. It wants different. And it wants action. Um. And this tripped me up for the longest time. So when I kind of, you know, gave, heard that, that whole oh, surrender or let go, there's different ways of, of doing it, right? So I think before any kind of seeking takes place, before the spiritual journey takes place, people are trying to swim up river, right? We say river is life. And they think, I can control it, I can go against it, I can shape it to my will, and I can do this, and I can swim up there, and I'll find what I want, and, and it will give me that ha lasting happiness, right? Even though we know that the, the happiness is always temporary, and is really only because of ending of the desire, not because of what you actually get that you desired, it's because you, at that moment, lack a desire but we make the wrong connection and think, oh, it's because of what I was desiring that I've now achieved it. But if it were that, then it would never end, right? But yeah. moments after fulfilling the desire of, you know, chocolate or drugs or sex or wine or whatever it is, not, there's nothing wrong with these things, but, it, you know, people seek those out to fulfill, then it, it kicks off again. You know, it's like, oh, well, I need to do that again or that's not good enough. So I think before, when people are still in the materialist world and they see themselves as separate individuals, like I did, they'll try all these different things and, and they'll try swimming up river against life. <clears throat> then if they go into the spiritual realm, even if they're not pursuing it actively, like, you know, it, it's that they've seen the light in a sense that there's something missing. 
And they might get to that stage where they hear that phrase, you know, let go or, you know, stop seeking or surrender. And what I did, and I've seen other, people's do, other people do, is mm. they stand in the river, right? They say, yeah. oh, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. Yes. But they're, but they're actively doing nothing. Mm -hmm. right? So there, there was a period of months after one of these episodes I explained to you that um, I couldn't operate on a human level like i i was unable to work or really do anything but really i was standing in the river of life like i was tr i wasn't trying to shape it but i was not going with the flow and that's the difference you can look like you're doing nothing by standing in the river but you're actually resisting it's an active surrender mm -hmm. whereas the, the letting go that needs to be done is not a doing. And that's why it's so infuriating to the mind because it wants something to do. Um, but it's literally just a, you know, you let go. Like it's the same, another metaphor that I found helpful is, you know, when a guy falls down a well, it's a bottomless well. <laughs> and the first hour that he falls down the well he's like this he's scrabbling oh my god there's nothing to grab onto i'm disorientated this is a totally new situation from where i was at the top of the well i'm zooming down i don't know what's at the bottom there's all these fears and unknown and he's struggling and then you see a picture of him a week later because it's a bottomless well and he's just lying back like this ah and that that takes time um that takes time. And I, I think it's this, again, words are kind of stupid and, and not good enough, but um, it's this sort of, in, what they call embodiment, don't they? Of, you know, you, you can, I think most people will get it on the mind. I think most people in spirituality, once they've been in it for any amount of time, understand mm -hmm. the concept mentally and intellectually. Mm -hmm. um, but then it needs to be felt at like the heart level, like you need to have really whatever it is. I mean, there's no right or wrong. I don't even want to give an example, but it needs to be felt at the heart level. Something has to have moved the heart so that you just know. It's not like I know the book. It's like you become the truth that you understood mentally. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's that embodiment phase or stage which is well okay now that you know that and now that you feel that in your heart and you've been moved in that way how do you now operate in the world and are you are you living from that um so i love my metaphors as you probably know already but the the best way that i can describe how things are today is the it's two metaphors. One is the, you know, those inflatable men that you get outside four courts, mainly in the yes. USA. Those things. So it's kind of just like that. Like it, something makes you move, like makes this thing move. Um, and then the other metaphor is the whack a mole game, an arcade, that it's literally just. I'm not planning stuff. There's no planning. There's no real strategy. There's no, definitely no desire or want or need for for anything. But there's not a hermit life or type existence either. It's, you know, if something pops up, it gets whacked. Excuse me. If something needs dealt with, mm -hmm. um, it gets mm -hmm. done. And I think the, there's sort of three, I believe there's three drivers now. So there's, Devotion, which is a devotion to the truth that that I've known, which is doing things like this, so it, you know, helping others mm -hmm. maybe experience the truth or deepen their understanding. There's a duty to the human aspect, not just myself, but my physicality, the mind, but a duty to family, to society. And then I think the third is desire, you know, that those human being desires that 
maybe come from you know a sense of lack basically mm -hmm. um and it's just kind of recognizing what's what um but just in the sense that that the fence kind of is always loving and openly smiling or any objects i just feel the same way like there's just never a problem even though you know if i stub my toe i might swear or whatever or if something in business isn't going great like oh no it's not going great but it's never it's the background that you know what i know i am is is not bothered like how i mean how could it be how could i be bothered about any of that stuff you know it's just um it's it's all part of it i think i think that's the other thing is that it, there's only all that there is like there's only all that there is and, and everything is in that so there's never there's no wrongness there's no oh i've slipped out of it oh you know it's not a it's not a state um it doesn't have to be maintained because like you say there's that weight right so when people have these stories it's like you carry around all this stuff and then you have different lenses as well. So, you know, you might carry around a book about childhood or a book about what you are as a as an employee or a book about family. And you carry all these things around and you end up almost crippled under the weight of all this stuff that you only really... It's only maintained or even prolonged because you actually go back to it. And you can eat quite as easily just put it down. And then yeah. the lenses are linked to the stories. You know, you think, oh, well, that if that's who I am, therefore I'm going to look at things this way. So you end up with all these lenses bringing your head down so you can't quite see the, the truth. Your back is arched because of the weight of all the stories. And the, the I mean, the the part for me that aided me in seeing that clearly was um when i stepped off the the bike so i was seriously into bike racing i would cycle 200 miles a week i would be out on my bike pretty much every day of the year no matter what the weather and chances you know in scotland is saying something um and over a period of years i i became amateur serious amateur cyclist that was my identity <laughs> And everything that I did and everything that I thought about was geared towards building that and sustaining that. And then when I I'd got to this world championship event, amateur world championship event, I realized this what the heck am I doing? Like what this is crazy. And I just got off the bike and it, and that just identity just went like instantly. And as that had gone so quickly everything else followed pretty swiftly after because it just made me see that oh yeah that that's just something that the mind said to itself it's just stories it's just books that you're carrying and lenses that you're looking through you know it's not it's not the reality at all yes 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 and you know you, you made a good point with respect to the you know seeking game because i think what happens is that the ego can become so in or the identification with being a spiritual seeker let's put it like that can become so identified with that there's often and and there's then there's a feeling of accumulation you know you've done all these retreats you've you know read all these books you know this you know that you know about the chakras or you know whatever the story is around all of that and then there can be some fear around you know kind of dropping that or seeing through all of that because of the time that's been invested it's a bit like you know and you throw throw good money after bad as they say when you keep having a car repaired <laughs> that yeah. isn't you know what I mean um so there can be that there can be this this fear about well you know who am I or what is left if I if I stop investing time with this spiritual community or with with my studies or you know whatever that story is mm. and then and then also um with respect to what you said about, you know, dropping seeking, it used to drive me mad as well because, you know, it's like, how do you do that? How do you do that, you know? 
especially when you invested in being a spiritual seeker. But, but you know, what I always say is, is, you know, just let it run its course, because if you try ahead of kind of burning that out, so to speak, if you try and sort of hold yourself, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm stopping seeking, I'm stopping seeking. It, it's, it's like you said, you're just, you are holding a position which is a, a position of resistance um, with respect to what is and what is unfolding right now. So I think you kind of have to, you have to be natural. You have to let things flow easily and easily. Um, but at, at, at a certain point, it seems, it was certainly that way in my story, that there was this clear seeing that seeking wasn't it. And, and it wouldn't take me anywhere. It wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't present me with this this kind of gold cup of enlightenment or however you want. <laughs> um, and I think this is a common it's a common story with with many seekers that that they feel they've invested a lot of time and effort and energy and they don't want to stop because there's fear around what that might look like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it becomes a subtle form of materialism, basically, but in in a spiritual sense, rather than collecting you know, relationships or diving into substances or experiences, then it becomes, oh, well, it's different because it's spiritual. But the moment that, you know, the moment that you reach for something, you are reinforcing separation. You're saying, I don't have something. Mm -hmm. um, but they do say, I, I don't know if there was any bit ever been attributed to anybody, but there's that the quote that um see, seeking does not lead to enlightenment, but only seekers uh become enlightened. Or only those who seek become enlightened. But I mean obviously, you know, enlightenment is a whole paradox in itself because you you know, enlightenment does to the person like fire does to a match. You know, you don't the, the match doesn't get the the fire. It doesn't get to keep the fire. In fact, it just annihilates the, the idea of what you thought you were. Like the metaphor that I use, I always try and come up with these metaphors that sort of get closest, closest to the truth. And one is this prism idea. You know the cover of the Pink Floyd album with the, yeah. the beam of light and then you have the prism, so white light mm -hmm. going in prism and then a rainbow going out so the idea is that there is only all that there is and that is you call it whatever you want every word is not good enough right it does doesn't do that do justice to it but let's just say it's the light of awareness you could call it consciousness or spirit or god or all that there is or whatever but it's only there's only one so this light is everywhere it because it's everything and everything is within that and everything is created by that and anything that's observing anything is also that um but when you look into a room like if you know if i look at your you know your location you look at my that you we can't physically pinpoint and point to light but it's there right because it's so dispersed but then it gets narrowed so i see the narrowing as as the body Okay, so the body is a narrowing of consciousness. You have this glo global uh, universal consciousness, and then you have this narrowing. So, it, so now it's a white beam of light. Then it goes into the prism. Now the prism in this analogy is the mind, because the mind, to say, is a separation machine. So it takes this consciousness, separates it, and it starts saying, okay, that is a tree, that is a fish, that is Julie, that is Sonia, that is YouTube. You know, it defines, <laughs> separates all of that stuff. But with if you remove any of these aspects, the light is is still. Right. So if you remove the prism of the mind, it doesn't affect the light. Like the light is that. So all of the, the rainbow of experience is still just the light of consciousness you know if you remove the narrowing it doesn't affect the consciousness it's it still is that so it kind of helps to sort of try and understand this 
universal nature to everything that and of course it's easier said than done that there is literally nowhere to go um and nothing to seek and the moment that you try and reach or you you know because they have two paths and they talk about two paths in spirituality don't they They're an outward path where you devote to a god or a, a guru or a practice or an inward path where you investigate the nature of yourself or so self-inquiry but both of those set up a, a situation where it, it's assumed that there's a separate you doing it and that it's assumed that there's separation to what you're trying to so-called get mm -hmm. um but i think the reason those t two paths exist and and all the practices in each one like the outward and the inward is because ultimately they lead to the same place which is the the collapse of the separation so you know going out to to god for example devotion to god getting closer to god and then eventually oh god just is all that there is and i am that oh right it's gone and obviously the inward inquiry is the same what am i i'm not the body i'm not the mind i observe the thoughts you know and eventually that can lead to dissolution of the you know the idea or the illusion of a separate self as well um and then you have the direct path of course where people just oh just realize just you know you are this already <laughs> um which suggests that none of those actions are required but that that's where it, it kind of it gets complex in spirituality i don't, I don't think this is where the mind like just fails like you know i don't think there's a causality between doing those things and, and what happens the way i see it is it's like a, a firework you know you, once that spark has been lit that spark of inquiry which comes from itself because you, you are not separate to the universe i always tell people go just as an experiment this weekend just go and live outside of the universe for for the week like you you know you can't do it because you are the universe so that spark of seeking or, or wanting truth comes from itself but once it's lit it's going like you, you know it might have a longer fuse <laughs> you might have a short fuse there might be no fuse and suddenly it's bang i mean you know i had i had a chap reach out to me a few weeks ago uh, a golfer professional golfer not into spirituality was not seeking in any way who was quite um upset and um disorientated because he just woke up and realized he wasn't a separate person um which many people in spirituality are like oh, like oh, i want that how do i get that way so he he wasn't looking for it. he didn't want it he was in a position of like, oh, like like what's happening to me um but it, it wakes up to itself you know that i would say like the you know the cherry blossom every 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 bud on the cherry blossom tree blossoms some are quick some are slow some fall and make more trees but they eventually blossom you know some get eaten by an animal that poops and makes seeds and but every eventually they all it will you know awaken to itself as, as you said yes yes and sometimes, you know, what happened again in this story here <laughs> is it was a sentence. Um, I, I heard it was Muji, you know, and I'm not a follower of Muji, but uh, he was uh, conducting a retreat. And I just said, let me just go see what this is about. You know, it was in India. And um, he said, recognition of the self is the self. Honor that recognition. And so it was like, you know, it, there was this clear seeing that every time I'd listened to, you know, a, a master yogi or an enlightened teacher speak or point to the truth, something in me would kind of vibrate and pulsate and recognize the truth within what they were saying, right? And it had always been that way. 
I would often eat also hear them their responses inside me before they actually came out. Um, <clears throat> so there's this clear seeing that there was only one self and I was that. And the drive to keep seeking came out of that recognition, but I hadn't realized that what I was seeking for outwardly was already here as this. <laughs> so, so it was really this one sentence and um, that kind of, I guess, was the nail in the coffin, as I could put it like that. <laughs> Um, and sometimes that happens too. It just, I don't know, I, I, again, maybe, you know, the seeking burns itself out and then all that's needed is one set sentence or one small, you know, moment of seeing clearly. And then it's like, it's like game over. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and um, it can be so simple and so clear. It, well, it is so simple and so clear when it is seen but prior to that, it can feel like, oh, you know, <laughs> you're never getting there, wherever there is. And um, it can be very frustrating, really frustrating. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you had that. I had that, too, in terms of my story. <laughs> or maybe I need to meditate more or maybe I need to do more retreats or, you know, more japa or read more books or you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, um, and it's really much more simple than that. actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it, uh, yeah. I think it kind of needs to, it needs to happen until it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you you have to be very, very honest with yourself. Yes. Um, because it, there was a period where, you know, I, like what I explained in, earlier on today with us together i'd kind of grasped that a lot of that mentally so i'd taken that and said oh, i'm not I, i'm just not gonna meditate like there's no point like i'm out like i'm you know i'm not meditating i'm not um i'm not reading stuff anymore i'm out of the spiritual like this this is pointless like i've i see now you know i already am that blah 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 it wasn't a felt sense though it wasn't um and again, it's difficult, but it's like a it, it's like a hum. I've I've heard people say it's like tinnitus, but in a good way. Like yeah. it's just it's just always there. Like yeah. it's yes, um, like like a th I've it's like a throbbing is ha yeah sometimes a hum, but it's almost like this vibration, like a pulsation or a throbbing or yeah, like, yeah, or like yeah, yeah. So. I think back back at that time, I was, you know, I, I I would drift in and out. I was still at the flip flip flopping stage, and I think I kind of spat the dummy out, to to be honest, and was like, well, I don't need to seek. I don't need to do the practices, which I know we're saying now is all, is that on the absolute level is is true, but I think I wasn't, I wasn't at that depth at that point and like I, you know going back to what i said before i knew intellectually and maybe experienced the some of it at a heart level but it 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 wasn't it 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 just wasn't who i was at that point there hadn't been a full you know if we go back to the match the match was still there it might have been singed and it's, oh yeah i'm gone now you know but mm -hmm. whereas now it's like there's there's not even dust. Like it's just everything's gone in the wind, you know. Um, but even so, I still meditate occasionally. You know, it's it, if you're drawn to, um, you know, if if you're drawn to it, then I don't necessarily think it it it's a bad thing. I think because we're not again. It's this is where it gets complicated because we go back to the. You know, there's there's no doer. I've heard uh, Francis Lucille t tell this idea. It's like a little kid with a plastic steering wheel in the passenger seat of a car. Like, uh, you know, they think they're controlling it, but they're not. You're not controlling yeah. it. So, you know, the the choice to meditate or to quit seeking or to continue or go to like, I mean, we can't even control a sneeze. Like, how you know, how do we? Yeah, you know, I mean, we can't. You can't stop a sneeze or a blink. So why why would you think that any of 
all of this is actually malleable by one tiny finite perceived separate entity it's yes. it's crazy but yeah. when when you're in when you still see as that and you still operate as, as a separate self of course you're still in that you're still the kid with a steering wheel like no 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 i am definitely doing this <laughs> um so yeah, yeah you you feel like you should do something even even if the doing is the doing of stopping <laughs> yes yes and i you know i'm with you i i, I you know i don't have the same kind of uh, rigorous meditation and chanting practices that i you mm. know i held on to for years but you know occasionally i will sit and meditate um and but but the a kind of a deeper calling for me was always to go into the silence within my own being and to just see how far you know how deep does that go mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. but yeah i mean if if i'm led to meditate or it feels like the right thing to do you know i'll, I'll, I'll sit and meditate for a little while but but it's what I re recognize is that I'm not looking for anything from it, you know, <laughs> all of that. It's just this, this natural kind of outflowing or expression or whatever you want to call it, you know, with respect to honoring the self or honoring the truth yeah. uh, of who I am. And, um, and there's a real sweetness to that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, it's just allowing, you know, everything to be, you know, as it is. You're not interfering. You're not looking for anything. Um, prior to this, I remember I would, I, I used to, like yourself, I used to have a quite a regimented uh, meditation practice. And at the time I had, uh, my kids were uh, pretty young. I think they were one and three. <clears throat> so I would have to get up at 5 a.m. in the morning to try and get, uh, quiet time in right and at this period i was I, I need to do this because it was mind right outcome i don't mm -hmm. have it i lack something if i do this classic you know so yes, yes. Over, oversimplified if i do this therefore i'll see yeah. something get something yeah. and that that will be it um so and quite often what would happen at, at sort of quarter past five is my son would wake up crying he'd need his his nappy change and maybe my wife would get there first or she she was on night you know she'd done the night shift so i'd end up going up and go, oh, i've been disturbed again you know from, from meditation let me go up change a nappy and but one day that ha the i was meditating and i heard the crying and i just i opened my eyes and I went up and I changed the nappy, but I was still meditating. Like it just, it, it was so obvious to me that like, what have you been doing all, all this yeah. time? Like it, I think it's uh, Rupert Spira says, you know, meditation is not something you do. It's something you are. Yes. Um, and from that yes. point onwards, I was like, yeah, it, the, the seeking of a, an experience in meditation and a, an end goal just just fell away. Um, I'd say just sometimes throughout the day, like if there's nothing happening, I just find myself with my eyes closed, but I'm not like, oh, I am medit like I'm not, you know, on a cushion. I'm not saying, right, we'll do this for 20 minutes or it just seems to be what's happening, but it there's no line between that and what was allegedly happening before and and after it's just that's just the river if you like it's just what, what the rivers happens to be doing it through this you know it's weird yes <laughs> yes yeah i mean yeah <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> as you said earlier it, it's really hard to put into words but um it it, it is kind of a cosmic joke when <laughs> you start to see <laughs> you know, what the beliefs were and what, you know, what you were trying to do, trying to get to and all of those things. And um, it's kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, on that note, um, I think we're at the, pretty much at the end of our time together today. Um, but before we go, uh, I'd love you to let people know where they can find you. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, just look up 
uh, Sonia on YouTube and you should find uh, some videos from me there on these kind of uh, themes. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Sonia. I really love this conversation. It's, it's amazing how different our stories are, but how many kind of similarities there are with respect to waking up and seeing through the illusion. So oh, thank, thank you. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Yes, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you being here. If you enjoy this content, then let everybody know. And um, if you haven't subscribed, I would really appreciate if you subscribe. So thanks so much again. Uh, have a great rest of the day and see you again soon. Bye.